What's next for the Florida Gators on the recruiting trail? We got that and more with Brian Smith, Locked On's Recruiting Insider. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Locked On Gators, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free. Right this in the podcast and on YouTube. And joining us now is Brian Smith. Joining me now for Locked On Gators is Brian Smith, Locked On's recruiting insider and the host of Locked On Seminoles, which is we'll just skate past that one. Uh, before we get t- started, I'd like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the Locked On College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash Locked On College. Terms and conditions apply. And Brian, Florida has the potential to add a bit to their recruiting class this weekend. Ben Hanks Jr. being the most notable name. Legacy corner, obviously his dad's Ben Hanks Sr. Played for the Gators. Just aging myself here before I was born. Um, but Ben Hanks Jr. is now set to announce his commitment. Uh, it's between Florida, Miami, and Louisville. What's your feel for when for where Ben Hanks Jr. winds up? Gators. That would be my guess. I haven't heard anything on the Miami end um, here recently. There for a while, I heard some things, and I know they would probably take him. But I've heard Florida. Uh, his dad being who it is, and I do remember him playing, uh, he was really good. I'd imagine that that's a big deal. I highly doubt, though, that Miami or Florida State or anybody else will kick off the trail on that one, though. That'll be interesting. Yeah, um, I do have to ask just what what's – because it's been a while since we've talked about him specifically. What are your thoughts on him just as, as a corner in general or as a recruit in general? I think he could probably play anywhere in the secondary – Long term, he needs to add some weight. Um, typical South Florida kid, though, he could run, he could turn, he could break on the ball. He's physical and he's really long, but his arm length is impressive. The only thing about him is he's just not thick yet. But if he added 15 pounds, which is almost impossible to do if you go to college just being a student, he could be your free safety, too. He's got the ranginess you want, and maybe it just depends on how he kind of clicks in his head with it. But maybe he's a nickel option as well. That obviously is a Horrible spot to play if you're DB anymore. You're always at a disadvantage, it seems like. But that's something that he could do. He's playing against South Florida kids every day. You don't get better training than that. Uh, it's high-end track, and it's high-end football competition year-round. So I think Hanks is just good at whatever he wants to do in the second. I don't think it matters. Yeah, um, I've been very vocal. I think that Nickel is the second-hardest position in football outside of quarterback. Uh, yep. I, I've told people like I I played safety, I played corner, I couldn't play nickel. Um, I I don't think there's ever been anybody more toast than when I tried to play nickel. It's just it, it's hell to be at. Uh, <laughs> I like I like that you mentioned Ben Hanks' length though because that's been something that I've talked about a lot on this yeah. show. He's listed as uh, I think six one is what he's listed as, but I'd be willing to put money that he's got a six four six five wingspan. Like he just looks I would like say that. six five. Yeah, yeah, he he's just, the kind of guy you throw an alley oop to. Yep. Yeah. He, he just looks insanely long there. Uh, you mentioned being able to, to move around the secondary. And that was another thing I wanted to ask about where I feel like he's viewed as, a, as a true corner for lack of better term, where, you know, we talk about DJ Pickett and people go, Oh, he might be better at safety. Or you talk about Jameer Grimsley last year and people were legitimately saying, Hey, he might be better at receiver long term. I feel like oh, a lot of DBs in recent years, specifically at corners, We've heard, hey, he might be better at safety. Hey, he might be better. He might be better at receiver. But what are your thoughts on Ben Hanks Jr. as your corner one? Because that that's what he would be in this class for the Florida Gators. I think you're doing fine doing that. Guys that have his length, got his lineage, played at Booker T, have always been South Florida kids compete. I saw him as a sophomore. I knew then, like, okay, this kid's going to be able to pick what school he wants for the most part. There's really nothing that you go, ah, can't do it. In corner, you can usually tell, like, okay, we got to move this kid somewhere else. Never had that feeling even two years ago, let alone now. And he's gotten bigger, faster, stronger. So, yeah, I think he's 
he's corner number one for you in any given year. You're in a pretty good spot. Yeah, and then another DB that's committing this weekend um, that Florida is allegedly <laughs> in the running for is uh, is Bryce is Bryce Fitzgerald. Where do you think he winds up committing? Florida State. That would be my guess. Just process of elimination. But with that being said, let me let me preface this. He is from Columbus High School, the same high school as Alex Mirabal and Mario Cristobal. I find it odd that they're going to miss out on a kid from there and they're going to go let him go to Florida State. But I just, you know, I report news. I don't create it. So it looks like he's trending that way from somebody close to Florida State. They feel good. So stranger things have happened, but. Right now, it looks like a Miami Columbus kid's going to go to FSU. Yeah, uh, I, I have to ask because this feels like a weird ish recruitment because, you know, almost two months in the day, basically mid June, I feel like when we talked about Bryce Fitzgerald, the general consensus, and, and this was my reading the tea leaves also, was kind of wants to go to Miami, can't go to Miami might go to Florida as the consolation prize, I guess. And is now, he said Florida State and LSU were his top two. I feel like this is just a really weird tracking of his recruitment. And I'm not sure if it's just, hey, he's really good at keeping things a secret or what it is. LSU, I would get because they need DBs and they've got a history with it. It's an ironic combination. But Florida State, Satan's a South Florida guy. So that's the other thing that makes it realistic. And he's a, he is a very good defensive backs coach, no question. Used to be the head coach at American Heritage down there, which everybody recruits. I'm curious if that's part of it or if Miami really went after him. I, I can't imagine they didn't. Though. That's, I've heard different things on that, but it depends on who I talk to. I've never gotten the same answer twice in a row. So I'm out. When he announces, I'll know. Because I still think if Miami would have went after him day one and didn't tail off at all, he'd have ended up at Miami. That's my guess. But right now, I'm here in Florida State Suburbs. And, and I'm just going to ask this on the, again, I think unlikely chance that he winds up a Florida Gator. What are your thoughts on Bryce Fitzgerald as a recruit? Love the kid as a player. Uh, good kid. For those who don't know, Miami Columbus is an excellent high school. It's a private institution. It's a Catholic school down there always competitive in the state race every year and they have great coaching staff. He's disciplined. He can play receiver, he can play strong safety. He's a kid that could be your big nickel, like the big safety nickel, depending on what team you're playing. They put a, a tight end in the slot. Maybe you put Bryce there. Very valuable guy. So I'm surprised a, he's not ranked higher and B he's not talked about more as a recruit. Yeah. Uh, well, you could talk about him plenty with block on Seminoles. <laughs> We are, yeah, yeah. Probably will. <laughs> yeah, just saying. Uh, we are going to flip to the offensive side of the ball and talk about the potentially really good receiver room for the Florida Gators next on Locked On Gators. Game time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which means getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer that it gets to first pitch with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Game time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. And I'm telling you, I love the last minute deals. You can save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, whatever it is that you want to do. All in prices means that you don't have any surprise fees at checkout. It's a beautiful thing. Game time, they do it right. Brandon Sproke, Florida Gators legend, is with the New York Mets AAA team. If he gets a call up, I'm going to the game. I don't care. I'm going. Same. Take the guess we're going to buy MLB tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. Use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thanks for being Locked On Gators. Your first listen of the day every day. We are available daily and free. Remember this in the podcast and on YouTube. And Brian, we we talked about Ben Hanks Jr. and Bryce Fitzgerald committing this weekend. Next weekend, Nation Montgomery is committing. And it's been, I, I feel like, a long while since we last talked about him as a recruit. What's your evaluation of him as a receiver? And, and has it changed throughout, we'll say, the, the start of the 2025 class through now? 
I've known him for a good while, and he's a kid that can pick him up and put him down. Thin kid, got natural hands, best down the field. Really kind of fits what Napier did with this prior. Like you and I joked about this off air like six months ago. Every kid they get is just real fast, thin kid. You know what I mean? Nashon kind of fits that. Um, he's going to be at Central, I believe, this year. He's a kid that doesn't fear competition. I saw him at Future 50 last year against top DBs. Didn't bother him. My only question with him, like a lot of kids in South Florida, he needs to eat more and get bigger. When's that going to transpire? Just needs to fill out, which is typical of track kind of kids like him. But I think that he's a good football player, and he's a guy that they went with over some other guys that I know they could have had. They, they got a lot of faith in him in Gainesville. That's probably the most important. Don't trust what I think. They're making a lot more money than I am, I can assure you. Florida wants him more than some other key receivers in the state of Florida. This is good Florida, by the way, this is good Florida receiving class. So you add him to it, and you look at it from a perspective, he could probably play slot or outside. It's a good group. Yeah, uh, you, you don't make $7.3 million? No. I will check my account here in a second to confirm, but probably don't need to pick up my phone to get that. So yeah, you got, got to check the remittance email for uh, for, for this month. Uh, oh, wow. No man. problem. Hey, never know. Uh, Verdell Brown the third is committed. Joshua Moore is committed. Nashawn Montgomery. I've said I, I think he winds up being a Florida Gator. Uh, this is one where, you know, the the subtext insiders. I sent a message to them in, I, I want to say early June, late May, and I was like, hey, this yep. is I'm, I'm putting in a prediction for Nashawn Montgomery. I think he's going to be a Gator. It's a matter of when, not if that happens. And I got to ask. If he commits, we know that Florida, for the longest time, it was Florida wants four receivers in the class. That's it's right. kind of shifted to Florida wants three receivers in the class now. If those are your three, Vernon O'Brien III, Joshua Moore, and Nashawn Montgomery, what do you think about that, the hypothetical receiving class for 2025? I think it's top 10 nationally. I mean, especially if you just go by three man or less, somebody taking six, I don't count. They're getting kids that they want. They're getting a legacy kid. They're getting a kid from South Florida. I might say, I, it's pretty good, and you got the balance because I know people don't always look at it this way, but coaches do. One of the reasons Moore is so coveted is just physical stature. That is a big kid. He's at least 6'3", at least. He's over 200 pounds. He can be a pure boundary receiver. There aren't a lot of those guys in Florida. It's a bunch of 5'11", 6-foot kids running around everywhere. So that's, that's an impressive group, man. I think that they would be as good a – one, two, threes is the country. So Vernell kind of sets the pace there, in my opinion, because he's the most polished. But uh, whether or not they got him or not, the other two still really good. So based on what we saw last year in the style of Florida's passing, I know they completed a lot of passes, but not exactly the most aesthetically pleasing style of passing game. You know, five yards and in. Uh, no further comment because we saw that all year on Twitter about Florida fans. Yeah, they got mad. Uh, I, I understand if I'd have been a Florida fan, I'd have thrown things at the TV too. I get it. But with that, with those three, especially Josh, like he's such a big body kid. You can throw him money balls down the field that are covered well, and he'll just go up and get it. You know, jump ball, 50, 50 underthrown. And then you add two more shifty fast kids. You got to be pretty happy as a Gators fan. Yeah. And I, I would like to just say, cause I know that, you know, it, typical, Florida Gators fan base, the way we react to everything is if you say something positive, then we're going to come at you. If you say something negative, we're going to come at you. And I know that there's someone in there right now screaming about you uh, judging the passing attack for whatever it may be. Let me help you. Sitting there going, oh, Russ Calloway is going to come in now. Um, It's stunk. Okay. If anybody has any questions, it's stunk. I hated their passing game. I will say this. Up until he got hurt, up until Caleb Douglas got hurt, Graham Mertz was trying that contested catch with right. him. So may, maybe it was just he didn't feel like he had it. Khalil Jackson made a few of those. Uh, ideally, we'd like to see some more when you have someone that can turn in a 50-50 ball into a 75-25 ball, 70-30, whatever it is. Um, but I, I will say that just in their defense, which there are so many things to critique them about, they <laughs> tried it up until up until uh, Caleb Douglas got hurt, who now uh, – Texas Tech, so he'll, he'll get to do that. But I would like to ask you about Vernell, Joshua Moore, and Nation Montgomery. 
where would you stack them up in terms of just literally the three of them? Because I think Gators fans typically we look at Vernell Brown as he's he's the prize jewel there. He's the cream of the crop. He, he's your number one. But between Joshua Moore and Nashawn Montgomery, like where do you just personally stand on their rankings? Well, Josh is a little more raw maybe, uh, but he's a bigger kid still growing in his body. Nashawn, I mean, they both need technical work like all high school kids do, but Nashawn plays an easier spot because a lot of the time he'll be lined up off the line of scrimmage. Moore is going to be going up against a bigger, longer kid on the line at the boundary spot. That's a war. You, If you get beat there as the boundary corner, that's a really large man ahead of you. That's not going to end well. Uh, and it won't end well the next day on film review either. So I think the more important guy is more, but Nashawn might play earlier because I think it's just easier for those guys to adapt. It takes college weight room strength, not natural. I mean, and Josh is strong. I've met him. He's got quite the grip. I'd imagine he'll play some as a freshman because, again, there aren't a ton of those guys. How many 6'3 plus guys do they have coming back in 25? Like a UF? Maybe one or two. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like they're just, those guys just aren't walking around freely for anybody to get. So that's why Miami would still take him. That's why Florida State would still take him and probably a half dozen other prominent power four schools. But I think Nation will play early. I, I don't really care about the ranking yet. On Moore in particular, he doesn't play at a dominant program in South Florida or Nation's at Central. I mean, that's just, come on. Everybody and their brother that lives down there see Central play. And you can see them play on ESPN or something once every year, pretty much too. They beat IMG on the road a couple of years ago for crying out loud. So it's a different animal. I think more will develop and be just as good, if not better long-term, but I'll take Nation short-term. Uh, just, I checked. It is at most to Khalil Jackson and Marcus Burke are both red shirt juniors. They are the only receivers that are six, three or taller. Uh, Khalil Jackson's listed at six, three flat. Marcus Burke says six, three and three quarters there. Um, I do have to ask also, I feel like for all the, again, proper criticisms of Florida under Billy Napier, I feel like they've really just wrecked the house with receiver recruiting. I I feel like they've done such a good job there the whole time, which I know you could say it's, it's Florida. It's easy to recruit there. It is, but you still got to go. It hasn't been for them, but they, but they've done good. They've done well at receiver. Um, and so I just got that. That's insane to me that it's like, that's the only thing that they've done consistently. Great is QB and receiver. To put the numbers in front of you a few years ago, I counted it up. There were like 40 or 41 kids. This is like the 21 class or something like that, that we're going to sign division one out of Florida that I knew of before they signed. It's insane. That's just receive, not, not recruits, not recruits, receivers. And yeah, you know, some of them may fall into the cracks academically or something like that, but like they got the goods. So Florida has that advantage. It is the swamp. It is the SEC, but they're still getting it done because again, their passing game was not good. If you want to throw things at your TV or comment, I don't care. Uh, their boring passing game last year aside, they're still getting really top-notch players that could have went to Florida State or Georgia or other places. You got to give Florida staff a lot of credit. That's not easy. The kids they got committed, like the kids in their class, I was just looking at it. Overall, that's a pretty good class. There is a big donut at one spot that you and I were talking about a minute ago off air, but um, All right, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. <laughs> get there. I still don't understand how that's possible at Florida. Like that's just, but anyway. But the receiver recruiting, like, if they can somehow get through this year, and Graham's a good quarterback. He's accurate. He's consistent. He just needs guys to go get the ball. And the, and the guys in front of him, if I remember right, they gave up 39 sacks last year. That is atrocious. That wouldn't be shocking at all. You can, you can say any number, and I'll go, <laughs> yeah, that's not surprising. Legitimately, you can say any number above 30, and, I, and I'd yeah. buy it. Think of it this way. If you would have given UF – Miami's line last year, which gave up like 15, 16 sacks. Where would Mertz have been? Find like he was 20 touchdowns and three picks because they didn't throw the ball down the field. He'd have been at like 30 and five. And all three of his picks were tipped by his own receiver. All three. That's wild, by the way. So yeah. again, he keeps the ball out of harm's way. If you give him a really good offensive line, no doubt about it. They'd have, they'd have killed teams. 
because they got speed at receiver, and now you got Eugene back. Second year, you got a lot. Like Elijah's good. Uh, Arizona State fans probably hate you guys a lot, by the way. Um, yeah, I know. I know it's not your fault, and not that you care. But you got a one-two punch there. It's going to get paid eventually. If you can pass protect at all, and I, by the way, Miami's defensive front is nasty. We'll find out real quick. That they are not going to be shy. They, they got them in waves. If they can protect, Miami secondary is not that great. They got to prove otherwise. They're, they got one, like the returning corner is good, but a bunch of unproven guys otherwise. Border could put a bunch of points on the board against Miami and totally change their recruiting, Billy's trajectory, everything, which would be wild. But that's college football, and that's why you and I love it. So I, I'm really looking forward to that because – Again, the only thing I think about with Florida's offensive line is the play where Jared Verse picked up the guy and threw him at the quarterback. It's hilarious. And I don't say that because I come before State. I'm like, did that really just happen? That's one of the most comical plays in college football history. One hand. One hand, too. Do you one blame hand. Billy for calling short passing games? No. I understand why they did it. It still sucked. Yeah, no. It, it, it can be your best option, but also be boring. Like, yep. it, it Both can be true. Uh, it is. And I mean, hey, I mean, you look at how often tight ends were kept into pass block last year, and it's like, okay, we we know why they did that. Um, we, and they still had 39 seconds. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's it's rough stuff. Um, luckily, we're definitely not about to still talk about offensive linemen next on Locked On Gators. To wrap up today's show, I'm about to be driven to drink. It's like I, I I feel like death now, and then now we just have to talk about this, and I'm kind of hoping it just it just happens at this point. Um, the Florida Gators recruiting class right now will say, again, I think that they get Nashawn Montgomery, so then you've got three receivers, you're done there. We know that they've got two running backs in Waltez Clark and Chad Gasper. They're done at running back. Tight ends, they got Tayshawn, Gelsey, and Micah Jones. They're done at tight end. Defensive line, they've got uh, Jalen Wiggins. They've got uh, Jeremiah McLeod and Joseph Mbachu. Probably done on the defensive line. They've got a punter committed, so I'm assuming that they're done recruiting punters. Uh, they've got one safety, and we think that they will land Ben Hanks Jr. and Nashawn Montgomery. I have to ask the stupid question here, Brian. What else do the Florida Gators need to get in the 2025 recruiting class? Do you know of about four really good uncommitted offensive linemen running around anywhere? I can I can name one that's visited Florida. Yeah, he doesn't suck, but we'll talk about that in a second. But like, let me just have my fun with the rant for a second. You are the University of Florida. You are a Southeastern Conference school. Also, I'm sorry to cut you off real quick um, because I know I'm about to get comments about letting you say this. Go just no, just now, I'm just letting him say it. Doesn't necessarily mean I agree or disagree, <laughs> but he's allowed to say it, okay? Uh, and until he's proven wrong, I'm not going to argue about opinions. Continue, Brian. Thank you. How in the world do you have zero commitments when it's, in my opinion, a literal top five destination job for a head coach in college football. Zero offensive line commitments at the University of Florida. Are you kidding me? I, it, look, we just talked about in the last few moments, playing time is readily available based on what we witnessed last year. The comedy show up front, how do you have zero commitments? Let me be very clear. I may not be a Florida fan, but I'm not an idiot. That is one of the easiest places to recruit to in the country. How is that possible? Think about it. Your passing game is questionable, but a large part of that is due to the O-line. And you're still getting offensive linemen. No, you're not. You're not getting any. Oh, you're getting receivers, though. That makes no sense. That's on the offensive line coaching staff, and, and the OC to a certain degree. He's, he's responsible for all that, but there's no excuse. Billy, obviously, everything falls on him because it's his program. But is there anything there that you disagree with, Brandon? Mm -mm. Okay. 
I'm, I'm done. Have at it then. Yeah, they no, want to I, comment away. Go ahead. But yeah, everything no, I just stated right there. There's there's only so much you can say about the offensive line. Um, we know that Florida tried hard to flip Solomon Thomas. Sure. sure. And, and just modern day recruiting. We know how we operate. I don't care if someone says they shut it down. I don't care if it feels like there's nothing going on. Things can happen. So I'm not saying it's not going to happen, but things can happen. So we know they tried for Solomon Thomas. They tried for Zaire Addison. They're still trying for Tavares Dice. Um, and I think that's it for the top offensive tackles that are committed elsewhere. Oh, and um, John Mills, I believe, is listed as an interior offensive lineman. Uh, committed that's to Texas, Florida was second there. You would think it's not for like, right? yeah. I mean, they're, but they didn't get any of them. That's almost more frustrating. That it's not for a lack of trying. That that they're trying and just it's just you know. wild to me because I've never seen a major program be in this spot, especially like Billy didn't make any bones about it when he arrived. We want to be a run first downhill team. That screams offensive line recruiting, and apparently, for what you're telling me, they're trying. So what are they doing wrong here? Brandon, you explain that part to me. You're the expert on the Gators. I can't. Um, I, I simply can't. You look like I'm looking at just linemen that Florida offered. Taryn Hedrick was supposed to visit Florida officially and instead canceled that visit. Right. Went to officially visit somewhere else and then committed to Ole Miss, which was like a wild, a, a wild sequence that happened there. Um, that one was exactly. just a, a very odd. Peyton Joseph was committed. Um, and the report is that that was a fairly mutual breakup. Buy that yeah, if you no. want. Don't buy it if you want. Uh, Max Buchanan, Florida, fell out of that one pretty early on. Um, you you got to play the flip game here, I think. But there there's one uncommitted offensive lineman that we do have to talk about, and that is Michael Fasusi, uh, Texas really offensive lineman. I think it, Lewis, Louisville, Louis, Louis town. Yeah. Louis, He's Louis, from Louisville, Louisville, which is uh, right on the edge of Dallas. Okay. So, so Louisville, Texas, he's someone that when Florida brought Joe Hamilton back, that was the first name that I went on locked on Gators. And I was like, Hey, Florida is going to be back in this recruitment. Probably Joe Hamilton gets you in Florida or gets you into Texas. You've got to just finish the job there. Michael Fasusi visited campus, uh, for Grill in the Ville earlier this summer, a few weeks ago, potentially coming back this fall. I, I mean, I don't even know what's because obviously, if you land him, that's one lineman. That's not making your class good all of a sudden. Awesome. But that, that's a damn good offensive lineman to land, which I feel like would then make it even more confusing. As how is that the guy that you get the the offensive tackle from Texas? How is that the one that you get? Which, by the way, he's committing uh, in less than a week from today. He's not going to commit to Florida right now, but we know how recruiting works in 2024. You're not really committed until you sign somewhere. Um, and then we know that Florida wants to hit the portal for offensive linemen as well. I don't even I don't even know where I stand on it. it it's just it's it's such a weird situation. And I have to ask just in in your opinion, the state of Florida right now, high school, offensive line class. Is it a good class in high school? No. Let me cut to this real quick. There are two spots historically in Florida that aren't that great. It's quarterback and O-line. And things go in cycles. For whatever reason, this literally, like I live in Alabama now, there are more big guys in Alabama and Georgia. Don't know why. The schools named Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Georgia Tech. Love it, though. I can assure you that. And that's why Florida, Florida State, Miami, they all recruit up there to get linemen. So... State of Florida doesn't produce a ton of linemen, especially for the population it has. It's more smaller guys and edge guys. Don't know why. Um, it's always been that way. But the few kids that Miami did get this year in state for the most part, and Solomon, he is too. And, you know, you know, Florida got out recruited for some of the kids, but there's still not the same girth of numbers that you would think. And uh, I don't know why that is. Yeah, it's, it, it's an odd time. Uh, out recruited, outbid for some. Um, sure. But either way, that is not a complaint. It is That's the way it works today. Out yeah, recruiting right. works. You either adapt or die. Those are the rules. Yes, sir. Um, and and I've got to ask before I let you go. Last year, Florida had 
I, for, I forget the exact number. It was maybe like seventh class in the country at the time the, uh, that the season ended or shortly before the season ended, we'll say, uh, because I believe it was Missouri weekend, which was your second to last game where Jamonte Waller flipped from Florida to Auburn. So we'll say Missouri weekend, you had a top 10 class in Gainesville. Things crumbled. And when, when you go back and add the portal, Florida still had a, a very high ranked class for 2024. Uh, believe they still finished in, in the top 10 or 12. Uh, again, when you add the portal, let's, let's, let's just play the hypothetical game here. And I think you're going to love this one because you get to play the not, not so positive hypothetical game. We've heard a lot of recruits say, Hey, Florida, you win games. The doors open for us again. I'm not going to name any recruits just by name, but we know that that's something that the staff has been told. It's been reported about multiple recruits of, I need to see Florida succeed so that I know that their coaching staff is going to be here. Hell, that's the reason you didn't get Jameer Grimsley initially. He said, I'm committing to Alabama because I don't know if Florida's coaching staff is going to be there. Nick Saban retired. He immediately came to Florida. Wasn't even a second thought. So we know that some kids have that thought in their mind when they make that decision. Let's say you start off hot. You start off well. Uh, say you're five and one at one point and you land some commits. What happens at the end of the year when, when you have five games all against college football playoff contenders? Realistically, you want to win at least two. You can't state that. Uh, playing at Florida State to end, think about it. Florida State has a decent schedule, but it's not Florida State. Florida schedule. The end, they're going to be fresher, and you're playing in Tallahassee at Dope. That's going to be rough. You got Ole Miss in there. You got Georgia and Texas back to back, if I remember right. Yeah, it's, that's it's the first two, right? It's Georgia at the neutral site at Texas. You host uh, LSU, you host Ole Miss, and then you there travel you to Florida State. I mean, I think LSU is a little overrated. That this is the scariest thing. You could argue that the easiest game of that group, because their defense won't be any good, is LSU. I've never made that kind of statement in my life. LSU is one of the programs I follow very closely because they're always very talented. It's fun to watch them. If that is your weakest of five games, the scheduling gods have frowned upon you. So if they win two of those, maybe they'll be okay. But you can't lose all five. Obviously, you want to beat your rival at the end of your Florida State, stuff like that. Anything's possible. You never know. But they can't lose all five. Like, in your opinion, you, you're closer to it than me. If he did lose all five and they'd started like five and two. So the final five, you end up going, okay, that's not so great. We're five and seven. Can't be. Yep. You think they'll cut him? I think you should. Do you think they will? Should and will are not one and the same. I think that there are a couple of factors that go into that. Some behind the scenes, but also some sure. that you can see on the field of, is the team like you in five and seven last year? And you looked like dog crap at certain points, like the Arkansas game. You had Utah. the Missouri fourth and 14. You had Kentucky. the Utah game. You had Kentucky. You had quite a few games where it's like, what the hell are we seeing? If you go five and seven, but they're close losses, you beat the teams you're supposed to beat. Sure. I'm not, I'm not saying that I, th I would still keep you. I think if you lose the last five games, just get out because your class is probably going to crumble anyway. But uh, I, I think that. There's a chance if he wins five games or if, if he goes five and seven with losing the last five, as long as you look more put together, maybe, because that's been Billy Napier's big selling point as well this offseason is we're way more put together this year. Like, like we've got the foundation built. We've got everything set. We've got everything in place. We feel like we're, we're way more prepared here. You kind of just... You, you can't pull shoot here and say anything else at that point. You know, now it's. Well, you're setting yourself up. You better, you better come up with the W's. Yeah. No, I respect I'm... him. If he told the administration or anybody that. Yeah. But there's no place to hide. All their games are on TV. Just, this is a reminder. So yep. everybody's going to know. All right. I think that there's a pretty good chance he gets fired at five and seven, but it wouldn't shock me if they came out of the game. Like they got to win the Miami. They don't win the Miami game. It's going to be rough. And they lost Montreal, which sucks. Like, is that confirmed, by the way? He's not playing in that game? All but confirmed. When, when the injury came out, 
I put out an emergency episode and I said, I think he'll miss six to eight weeks. That's but if I'm Florida, I'm coming out and saying three to four weeks so that Miami at least prepares for him. They've had him listed as week to week. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, we're never going to get actual information. I mean, we don't even get told what most of the injuries are. We just get lower body, upper body. So we'll never really know uh, the extent of it until he's back on the field. Okay. If he doesn't play, those young running backs are going to be in pass protection against Miami's front. Good luck. Super fun. Um, <laughs> this is true. That's ruining not my day. Uh, <laughs> ru- ruining my day for these 34 minutes of of that with the last 10 just being so sad <laughs> but, but thank you so much brian this is brian smith locked on's recruiting insider and the host of locked on seminoles he will be back tomorrow where we get to talk more about what florida's rivals uh think about the florida gators which don't watch it if if you don't want to be mad because i get the feeling um not every conversation is going to be positive about that but we will be back tomorrow thank you so much brian thank you very much i'll talk to you soon thanks for being locked on gators your first listen of the day every day we are available daily and free ready to the podcast and on youtube for locked on gators i'm brandon olson don't forget to follow me on twitter at wns underscore brandon find all my written work with giants country and nfl 33 and i'll see you all next time